battle, the best thing you can do is open your mouth and begin to praise God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Amen? Because you are declaring that God is victorious in your life. Can you say amen to that? Hey, Pete, can you give me a, I don't know if it's a little more here, a little less out there. I'm not sure what this. Something just, just seems a little different. But we'll, we'll, we'll get by. We'll be all right. So how many of you are walking in fear today? No? Okay, that's, that's good. Well, I don't have to preach that message. Okay. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Let's just pray. We better do that just to get me, get me straight here. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence here today, O oh God. Thank you for the privilege and the blessing of gathering together in your presence, Lord, with your people, O oh God. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you are here in the midst of us. We thank you for those that are tuning in today. God, we pray your blessing on them in their household and everything that is going on in their lives. God, we just pray your blessing on each and every one. And we thank you, Lord, that your word, your word is life to our lives. And Lord, we just thank you that you speak to our hearts today in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Give my picture up there again. What kind of church? Fear. What kind of church? Fear. How many know there's a scared world out there? Huh? Have you noticed? Have you noticed that there's a scared world out there? That people are walking in fear like never before. And what they don't need is a fearful church. Say amen. amen. So we got a job to do. Can you say amen to that? Like never before, we have lights that need to shine like never before. Come on, say amen. amen. We have to be the ones that demonstrate that God is still on the throne. That God is still doing miraculous things. That God is still raising the dead. That God is still healing the sick. Come on. Amen. God is still God no matter what it looks like. No matter what's going on. No matter what politics are happening. No matter what you know economy is doing or viruses are trying to do. God is still God and God is still what he always has been. Good, great, wonderful. He's a healer. He's a blesser. He's a straightener outer. But listen to me. Virus is not the thing that we should fear most. The thing that we should fear most, or, or should I say uh, understand most, is the infection of fear. Because fear, you know, let me just tell you that statistically right now, I hate to even bring this stuff up, but statistically right now, there are more uh, young people between the ages of, I think, 10 and 18, somewhere in that, that, that uh, frame, that are taking their lives or dying from overdoses. And most of it is related to what is happening because of the virus. There are more young people dying from opioid overdoses and alcohol and suicide than they are dying from a virus. Are you listening to me? Yeah. And listen, when you have, you know, uh, kids, I don't want to get, you know, into this too much. I just want to say when, when you have children, you have adults, you have people that are, uh, you know, absolutely shut down from normalcy. I'm talking about normal humanity. I'm not just talking about, you know, uh, normal things. I'm talking about just it's normal, you know, being human. You know, it's normal to be close to people. It's normal to hug people. It's normal uh, to be around people. It's normal to talk to people face to face. Amen. Amen. And that is having a, an effect because of the fear of what could happen to us. <laughs> now, God said in his word, he said, Second Timothy 1, 7, I know you all know it, you know it by heart, but listen, you know, it's something that we need to not only know up here, but we need to have it here and walk in it, that God said, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, 
love and a sound mind. In other words, a mind that's not crazy thinking, oh my God, this is going to happen. Oh my God, this could happen. Oh my God, what's going to happen next? Oh my God. When you really don't mean, oh my God. (laughs) So fear infects us. And it is something that can totally, well, I'll get on in a minute. I'll get on in a minute. The easy translation says it this way. I, I, I like the easy translation because it's, it's easy. But it says this, be strong because God has given us his spirit and his spirit does not cause us to be afraid. His spirit doesn't cause us to be afraid. I said his spirit, if his spirit is in you, it doesn't cause you to be afraid. If you are afraid, if you are fearful, it ain't his spirit. Are you with me? Instead, he causes us to be strong to serve him. He helps us to love God and other people, and he helps us to rule ourselves properly. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxious fear brings depression. Anxious fear brings depression. How many know there's a lot of anxious fear? What's going to happen next? What about this? You know, and then, you know, the, uh, the virus uh, vaccine has been so politicized that people are afraid to even take the vaccine. Now, I'm not going to debate, you know, as far as the vaccine, you know, if you want to take it, it's up to you. But now they're talking about, you know, well, you got to watch, you know, the side effects that could happen with the vaccine. And we don't know if it's all that effective. And, you you know, it just goes on and on. So it's, you know, is a vaccine, you know, like a cure or something like that. You know, it's going to keep you from, you know, getting the virus. And now now people are fearing whether to take the vaccine or not. So, you know, do you fear the virus or do you fear the vaccine? Or you? And most people are fearing both. And fear brings depression. You know, I, I saw somewhere where the, the suicide rate in America, you know, in America, uh, we lose in, in, on a regular year, a regular year. How many know this ain't a regular year? In a regular year, we lose about 74,000 people to suicide. Twice as many people die by their own hand than are killed by somebody else in America. I know you don't hear about that much. You know, we, we, we put it on the news, you know, oh, you know, somebody got shot, somebody got killed. And, and, and sad to say, a whole lot of that is going on as well. But more than twice die by their own hand because of the anxious fears and the depression. And then, you know, the opioids and the alcohol, all that just they try to soothe the pain or the fear that they have and it, it takes them out. But God said this. He says, listen, verse, uh, 1 John 4, 18, he says, there is no fear in love. Man, that's a powerful statement. Amen. There is no, say no fear. There's no fear in love. And of course, God is what? So there's no fear in God. There's no fear in love. If you're in the love of God, he says, there is no fear. Perfect love Cast out, kicks out, throws out all fear because fear has torment. And he that fears is not made perfect in love. Now, that may sound like a rebuke to you, but if it does, just receive it. If you're in fear, you are not in perfect love. You don't understand how much God loves you. You don't understand how much God is for you. You don't understand how much he is with you. You don't understand the promises that he has made to you. Are you listening to me? Perfect love. His perfect love. When we know his love, we don't have to fear anything. Anything. There was a great uh, minister named Charles Spurgeon. Anybody ever hear of him? Charles Spurgeon, just a tremendous minister. I think I got a slide I wanted to put up there, a a, a statement that he made when uh, things were happening. He says, look, should I fear to die when cholera was was going around? He says, should I fear to die? Thank God I, I don't. I do not. I do not. The cholera may come again next summer. Pray it may not, but if it does, it matters not to me. Here's somebody walking in the perfect love of God. He feared nothing. He said, I will toil and visit the sick by night and by day until I drop. And if it takes me, sudden death is sudden glory. Come on, that's the kind of 
walk that we ought to have. Amen. Not being afraid of everything and everybody. Afraid to touch people. I, I think it's just, you know, insanity. You know, when, when governments are saying, you know, well, you better not have more than 10 people at your house or else we will send the SWAT team in to raid the house and take the turkey with us. And yet, Black Friday comes and everybody's in the mall, man. It's just thousands of people running around, bumping into each other and breathing the same air. I mean, how insane is that? Anyway, you can think what you want about it. Fear. Everybody say fear. fear. You don't want it, right? The, the word fear there it comes from a Greek word, phobos. You know, whenever you talk about phobias, it means you have fear. Fear of snakes, fear of spiders, fear of something. It's a phobia, right? Fear of heights. And the definition, fear, dread, terror, that which strikes terror. Fear is that which strikes terror. One definition says this, reverence for one's husband. <laughs> okay, move right along. But the word torment there, torment. It, listen, if you, if you have ever, I've experienced torment from fear in my past. It's torment. I mean, it is, another word for it is torture. Fear, when it takes hold of a life, is torture. It will torture you. Torment, extreme pain, anguish, the utmost degree of misery, either of body or of mind, torture. And I said it before, you can't allow even the slightest bit of fear come into your life. When it does, you need to cast it out. Just like he said, perfect love. You walk in perfect love. His love is perfect towards you. Your love perfect towards him. You need to cast out fear every time it comes knocking on your door. Whether it's a bill collector, whether it's a, you know, a doctor's report, or whatever it is, you need to cast that thing out quickly in Jesus' name. Amen? Let me show you something scientifically what fear can do. And, and it begins with thoughts, right? According to researchers, the vast majority, listen to this, a whopping 75 to, what does that say? 90 what? 98% of all illnesses? 98% of all illnesses that plague us are a direct result of our thought life. Where does it all begin? Oh, did you hear on the news? Did you, did you hear on the news what they said? Did you hear uh, the latest? Did you, did you know what's happened? Did you hear about the person down the street? You know, and, and the media, is, they're so good. You know, every night they put a story on of somebody that died to show the family mourning and how terrible it was. And it's terrible, don't get me wrong. But this has never been done before. We've had viruses and flus and things like that. But now it is like, we got to tell you the latest story of who died so that we can instill some more fear into you. They don't talk about the 99% that have, have recovered from it. Very seldom, do they? So it starts with the thoughts, the thoughts. The same works with faith. It starts with thoughts. You remember the, the woman with the issue of blood? The Bible says that she heard about Jesus. She heard a news report about Jesus, that he was going about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. She heard some news. It was good news to her. And out of what she heard, faith rose up in her heart, and she pursued to receive her healing. But the opposite of that is fear thoughts. Fear thoughts. And look what it does. This is, this is scientific, scientific understanding here. What we think about truly affects us physically, and emotionally. In fact, fear alone triggers more than 1,400 known physical and chemical responses in our bodies, activating more than 30 different hormones. Listen, and, and some of you don't need any more hormones. Activate it. Today, our culture is undergoing an epidemic of toxic thoughts that left unchecked create ideal conditions for illness. You know, we talked about, uh, uh, you've heard it, you know, comorbidity. In other words, you have certain things going on in your physical body 
And then when the virus comes, it can take you out easy because you already have stuff going on. I'm telling you, fear is a comorbidity. If you're walking in fear, these kinds of things are happening in your physical body. Now, don't, don't be afraid because you can take care of it. Amen? You got to stop the thought process. You got to stop the way you're thinking. You got to stop whatever you're reacting to. It has to end because you have to stop this cycle from going on. This is why we have first responders that end up with PTSD because they can't stop it. They can't stop the thoughts of the last a horrific thing that they saw or the multitude of things that they've seen over their career. And so many times, many times, actually, after they retire, they end up taking their life because they can't stand the pictures anymore, the thoughts anymore of the uh, of the misery that they have seen. We got to talk with and minister to a number of uh, first responders, police in particular, recently. I don't know if you saw the news. There was a a child that was severely tortured, almost to death. She's in the hospital now, but these, these first responders have to see these things and deal with these things. And I'm telling you, the pictures don't go away. And if you can't control your thoughts, you can't control what will happen in your physical body. I've talked about it, shared my testimony before about how I walked in fear for about nine months of my life. I couldn't slow my heart down. It just kept on, you know, at, at a, a, a rate that, that is not normal. Uh, I, I mean, just it was just insane. I was losing weight. I mean, I, I, I look at pictures back then and uh, my, my face was kind of drawn, you know, because I wasn't eating right. I wasn't sleeping right. It was hell. It was torment. But it was what I was thinking, what I was seeing in my head that was causing this torment to go on in my body. And my body was breaking down because of the thoughts that were happening in my head. I like what Graham Cook said recently. He said, giants, even giants of fear, giants of a virus, giants of political unrest, giants of whatever, whatever. Giants shouldn't frighten us. They should get us excited. <laughs> like Caleb, he got excited. He said, give me my mountain. I want to take my mountain. He was 85, is that right? 85 years old. I mean, he had to wait. He had to wait for all those years, all those knuckleheads that wouldn't believe God, and they all died in the desert, in the wilderness. But Caleb said, I'm just as strong as I was when I was 45. I am stronger today, in fact, and I'm ready. I want my mountain and giants will be my breakfast. Come on, that's the attitude that we as true believers ought to have. Whatever giants come our way, we all say, I'm getting ready to eat. I'm getting ready because he says we ought to get excited. The victory that's about to come. The victory that's about to come. We all know about David and Goliath. I mean, he, the guy was huge, you know. He was a soldier from the time he was a little boy, and now he's nine foot, ten inches tall, and he's all got the armor and he's got the sword, he's got it all. And David, listen, it didn't matter to him. He saw the victory. He saw the victory. And so whatever, whatever it is that causes fear, that's what you gotta run to. You know, there's an old saying, I think they made a song out of it. Run to the roar. Run to the roar. Whatever scares you, run toward it. Run toward it. Amen. Don't run away from it. Run toward it. Face it. Defeat it. Amen. I was reading this statement yesterday, I think it was the day before. And in the middle of this sentence, I saw these words. It said, faith is not a proof. It is a trust. Faith is not a proof. It is a trust. And I read that and I, and I thought, yeah, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I gotta, I gotta chew on that one a little bit there because I'm not, I'm not sure. But it just struck me. Faith is not a proof. It is a trust. Now, how I many know we are living faith here? How I many know we preach faith? We believe in faith. 
Amen. But faith is not proof. Hebrews 11 one says what? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things we ain't got in the natural, things we don't see, things that haven't happened. But here's where we miss it sometimes when we are walking by faith, when we don't see things happen instantly, immediately, within a day or two or a couple of weeks or a month or a year or a couple of years or, uh, uh, you know, a decade. If we don't see them, then we don't have faith. That's the way we think sometimes. If the miracle didn't happen right away, then where's the proof? See, but the understanding is that it is a trust, not a proof. See, faith says, I believe what God said, which means I trust. I mean, if you have somebody that's a really good friend, And he tells you something like he's going to be at church at 1030 when church starts. In fact, being here 1030 is really late. You know, actually, he said he's going to be here at 20 after because he wants to get here and pray ahead of time and and be a blessing and, and just, you know, pour out his heart for the people that are coming in the door. Right. And if he said that, if he's a reliable somebody that you know, that you know, that, you know, when he tells you, when he gives you his word, that means it's going to come to pass. You're going to see him at 1020 when he said he'd be here. Am I right about it? How much more when God says something, even if we don't see it right away, we can lose trust. We can lose faith because we don't see it right away. And instead of standing in that, I trust you, Lord, no matter what, I trust you. I don't know how long it may take. I don't know what's going to happen between now and then, but I trust you because you said it. And I'm going to keep on moving forward, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, no matter what they say or he says or she says, I'm going to trust what you said, no matter how long it takes. Because faith is not just a proof or not really a proof or not the evidence that you see right away, but it is a trust that you have. And when you buy into that trust, It's like Kenneth Hagin used to say, when you're ready to believe forever, it won't be that long when you see it. Listen to this, Hebrews 11.4 says, it was faith that made the difference. I'm reading out of the uh, mirror translation. It was faith that made the difference between the sacrifices of Abel and Cain and confirmed Abel's righteousness. God bore witness to his righteousness as a gift rather than a reward, even though he was murdered. His faith continued to be a most relevant prophetic voice. Wow. Think about that. I don't know about you, but do you want your voice and your trust in God to go beyond your life? Because listen, I I was listening actually yesterday to uh, 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 the grandson of uh, Reverend Violet Kitely. She was a great prophetic voice. Uh, you know, out of um, Oakland, California. They went there many years ago. Uh, her husband and, and, and uh, uh, her uh, started a church there. It was called Shiloh. And uh, I mean, she was just powerful. She actually prophesied over us, laid hands on us when we were ordained. And, and uh, I mean, just this strong woman of God. And the grandson was, was just sharing a, a, a memorial about his grandmother and all the things that she taught him. And it was just awesome because her voice and what she imparted, you know, not only to him, but but to hundreds and thousands of others, but what she imparted to him, her voice and her trust in God now are going on. The legacy is continuing because of the stand and the voice that she had and the faith and the trust that she had in her God. I don't know about you, but I want that. I want that. I want my kids, grandkids, great grandkids and great, great grandkids. You know, we we actually could live to see great, great, great grandkids. Isn't that amazing? 
But I want my voice, my life to go beyond this world. Hebrews 11.5 says, Enoch enjoyed God's favor by faith. In spite of Adam's fall, he proved that faith defeats death. Hebrews 11.7 says, Noah received divine instruction to save his household from judgment. Faith prompted him to construct the ark immediately, long before the rains were evident. I know we've read these things before, but, you know, just stop and think about it for a moment. What was, what was uh, Noah, what was he trusting in? What was he trusting in? That God said something. You know, he didn't even have it written down. You know, we could look up the Bible and say, well, is it, is it written? It is, you know, Jesus said it is written, it is written. Noah couldn't look and say, well, it's written. Build an ark. Wait a minute, what's it? Build, build, build an ark. I can't find build an ark. False prophet. False prophet. I must not have been hearing from God. It must have been that pizza I ate last night. You know, sister so-and-so prophesied, you know, I mean, something. you know, I don't know. But no, he trusted in what he heard. Trusted in what he heard. And before it rained, you know, he, he built an ark. Well, you're talking about crazy. You're talking about crazy trust. Wow. I mean, we, we can't even stop and think and imagine in any way building an ark. You know, they have a replica of it somewhere. Was it Tennessee, Kentucky, somewhere? Built a, a replica, I mean, at the exact size, and it's huge, huge. Can you imagine that? Only on a voice that he trusted. Just a voice that he trusted. And you know, in the day that we live in, we got to get to a place where we trust the voice we hear. As Hebrew says, you know, you, you spend enough time in the word that you can divide and discern what voice you're hearing. Whether that voice is saying to you, you know, buy, build, leave, go, you know, stay, whatever, whatever. You know, you need to know you're hearing the right voice because it's in that voice that you can put your total trust and see the things happen that God has ordained for your life. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And lastly, let me just throw this out to you. Faith is not a proof. It's a trust. You can go on and read in the rest of Hebrews and talk about those that were sawn in two, those that, you know, gave up their deliverance, those that did this, those that did that. You know, they were killed by lions, and on and on and on. But the Bible says of them, they trusted God. Now, we may look at that and say, well, they trusted God. Then how come that happened to them? Actually says they, they decided not to receive their deliverance many times. But we cannot listen, we cannot here, here's sometimes what, what faith people do. If they don't see it right away, they think God didn't hear them. They think their faith is in vain. They think that there's there's got to be somebody else's faith that might help me out. Are you listening? But it says about them, the great hall of faith, it says, their lives were trophies to their faith. As the substance of what was visualized by their hope and the evidence of things that their natural eyes never saw. I know I've read many times and preached on Abraham, the faith of Abraham. He heard the voice of God say, take your only son, Isaac, and offer him to me as a sacrifice. On a voice, on a voice, he took his son that they say was probably about 15 years old because, you know, uh, Isaac carried the wood on his back, which is, uh, you know, the symbolic of Jesus carrying the cross and there's, there's a whole lot of symbolism there. But anyway, he carried the wood and, and uh, they, they, they went up to the mountain and he built the altar and he put the wood on, wood on the altar and had the fire ready to go. And then he says, come here, boy. It's, it's hard to wrap your brain around that. <laughs> come here, son. 15 years old. I mean, though, 15 years old, he, he, he could have fought his father. 
He could have resisted. But like Jesus, he was a submissive son. And he said, but, but, but Father, where's, where's, the, where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? You're it, boy. <laughs> but he said, God will provide. And he, and he tied him down and had the knife in his hand. And the knife, he had already, he had already in his heart, in mind, in, in action, taken the life of his son. But the angel stopped him maybe at the last second. And God said, no, I, I know. But it says that Abraham so believed and trusted what God said that he actually envisioned the ashes reformulating into the body of Isaac coming back to life again. That's what it says in Hebrews. And I just read yesterday, I never saw it before. But you remember when, when Jesus was... Uh, uh, Religious people are just demonic. But they were attacking Jesus. Every time he did something, they attacked him. You know, it's sort of like the liberal press. But anyway, um, they just kept attacking him and attacking him. And so, you know, they said some things to him, you know, and he said, well, before Abraham was, I am. And then he says, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. And what I saw was that when Abraham was seeing Isaac raised back to life again, he was actually seeing the promise who was Christ himself. Because of the sacrifice of Isaac, he opened the door for the sacrifice of the promise himself. And he saw that. So we don't need to be a fearful church. Can you say amen? We need to be fearless in this day and in this hour. We don't need to talk all the doubt and unbelief and fear that people are walking in. We need to be the voices of those that hear from God, that trust in God and can tell people, listen, don't worry about it. Don't be in fear about it. It'll only tear you down. You need to have faith that God is still on the throne. And guess what? Whatever your problem is, he's right here. Trust him. He will help you. He will take you through it. He will heal you. He will deliver you. He is still the redeemer. And I don't know about you, but my redeemer lives. My redeemer lives. And so does yours. Amen. Stand to your feet, would you? Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. And see, you know, so I make sure I'm not offending anybody. I probably did. But anyway, I, I, you know, I don't plan on it, but sometimes I do. But I'm just saying, you know, you go out there and, and obviously... Uh, you know, you can get a lot of flack if you're not wearing a mask, and that's okay. And you want to wear a mask wherever you go in church, whatever, that's, that's fine. You know, there's no condemnation there whatsoever. You know, I think it's a good idea people wash their hands. I don't know why it has to be, a, you know, a national mandate or, you know, an international mandate, you know, to wash your hands, you know. It's just wash your hands. Um, it's just a really, you know, it's a good thing to do. Amen. But listen, the thing that we need to do more than any other thing, all good safeguards, all that kind of stuff, fine. But the number one thing is don't be in fear. Don't be in fear. Don't be afraid of a disease. Don't be afraid of a virus. Don't be afraid of what could happen to you. Because fear itself will become an underlying cause that you or I don't need. Oh, man. Can you say amen? So I'll just receive that, would you? Just receive that. Just, just open your hands like that. Let's just, just, just pray right now. Father, we thank you right now, God, that we were created to walk as Jesus walked on the earth. He feared nothing. Perfect love. 
filled his heart and mind and his words and he feared nothing. He was afraid of nothing. He's not afraid of leprosy. He was not afraid of any kind of sickness or disease or blood flow or anything else. God, we thank you that we want to walk like he walked. Not fearful, but reaching out, touching even the dead to see them raised to life. Dead physically or dead spiritually. God, we are needed more than ever before to be fearless, to help those that are walking in fear, to bring them the deliverance that they need. God, use us. Say, use me, Lord, as a light in the midst of this darkness. In the name of Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender it to you. Let your will be done in me. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen, amen.